Laurie Gottlieb, Marry Him. The case for settling for Mr. Good Enough. Hard won wisdom for lasting love. Two stories. Do either sound familiar? You're on your first date with a guy. He's kind, warm, you feel comfortable around him. You have a nice time and he seems into you. But somehow you just don't feel excited by him. You decide you're not feeling it. Or you've met up with the perfect guy. He's charming, attractive, confident. You get nervous just thinking about him. He said he had a great time too. But now it's days later and you're still waiting for him to text back. Finally, he pulls this move. He's too busy for a relationship right now. Back to the drawing board. Why is finding love so hard? Author Laurie Gottlieb thinks she can help. When it comes to finding a life partner, she believes a lot of women are going about it all wrong, and she's learned it the hard way. In Marry Him, Gottlieb shares her relationship foibles and follies so you can learn from her mistakes. She also consults with dating coaches, researchers, and professional matchmakers to discover how to find a great partner, and how not to. In this blink, you'll learn how to get what you want in a partner, and want what you get. Let's get started. Skip the fairy tale. Aim for good, not perfect. What's the silliest reason you've ever rejected someone? Have you ever broken up with the guy because he hasn't seen Casablanca? At the time of writing, author Laurie Gottlieb is 41 years old, a confident go-getter with a successful career. But she's dissatisfied that she still hasn't found the right guy. In researching her book, Gottlieb spoke with a group of female friends in the same boat. With some life experience under their belt, they talked about great guys they had rejected in the past, sometimes for trivial reasons. There was the sweet boyfriend who brought his partner flowers, but they were always the wrong kind of flowers. There was a guy who was plenty attractive but who had gross, untrimmed nose hairs that seemed too awkward to bring up. Then there's the guy who cried one too many times, one too many being twice. And finally, the guy whose partner said he loved me too much. He was so devoted to her that she concluded she must be pretty great. So surely she could do better. Now with more experience, these women looked back on some of those calls with regret. These were guys who loved them, treated them well, and met 80% of their criteria. So why did they walk away? In retrospect, it was partly because, though great partners, they just didn't seem to fit the mould of who these women thought they'd end up with. Society pumps out romantic tales, in pop songs, movies, novels and TV shows that we imbibe from an early age. We're flooded with images of attractive and successful people. We're sold fairy tale stories of romance, infatuation and total devotion. So people build a preconceived image of the perfect match, the right personality, occupation, interests the right face, the right height. We become overly attached to this fantasy and judge real people against it. Meanwhile, the culture of online dating encourages us to see the dating pool as inexhaustible. There could always be someone better around the corner. So why lower your standards? After all, it seems natural that someone who searches for longer will end up with something better right? But do they? Not necessarily. 
Let's look at why. I can't get no satisfaction. Picture this you're planning your summer vacation. You've worked so hard this past year, you're determined to make this trip the very best you can. So, first, you make a list of your criteria for destinations. You want great weather, stimulating cultural experiences, fun outdoor activities, and great food. And it's got to be affordable. You come up with a list of your top five destinations. But which of these is the best? You research every night after work, poring over web reviews and travel blogs. All five have good restaurants, but which are the greatest? Which are the best museums? And what's more important, having the best hiking trails or the best beaches? You sift through reams of information and finally make your top pick. But that's right, there's a problem. You spent so much time searching that flight prices have gone up. An accommodation? Forget about it. It seems like the less picky vacationers have already booked up all the cheapest spots. Now you can no longer afford any of your top five. You didn't want to compromise, but now, tragically, you're faced with making an even bigger compromise, or else not take a trip at all. Either way, someone else will be taking your dream vacation. You've fallen for the curse of the maximizer. The term maximizer comes from the work of American social scientist Barry Schwartz. A maximizer insists on finding the absolute best option available at nearly any cost in terms of time and energy. But what's an alternative strategy? Well, you could be what Schwartz calls a satisficer. Satisficers set a specific standard or threshold for what they consider an acceptable outcome. Then they search through their options until they find something that meets that standard, and then call it a day. The maximizer, on the other hand, isn't content with good enough. They can't stop searching until they found the very best. Having standards is one thing, but maximizing can come with a lot of downsides. It can make you anxious and paralyzed by decisions. And even once you've made a choice, the maximizer mentality can leave you dissatisfied with the result. You might end up booking your dream vacation, but when you get there, you can't stop thinking about the other destinations and whether one of them might have been better. In relationships, it's the same thing. Maximizers risk falling into a pattern of constantly searching and searching, never truly satisfied with what they have. Even if their current partner is a good match for them. And this can strain their relationships when their partners pick up on this attitude and feel inadequate or devalued. On the other hand, people who've learned to satisfy aren't so naggingly afraid of missing opportunities. And with less time spent searching, they have more time to enjoy the fruits of their decisions, whether partners, Vacations, or whatever else. Instead of striving endlessly for a perfect future, they can choose to enjoy life in the present. As Voltaire says, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's a lesson the author feels she learned too late. Let's look at her story next. For my husband, whoever you are, At the time of writing, Gottlieb is 41 and still looking for her soulmate. The dedication in her book reads For my husband, whoever you are. Gottlieb knew she wanted to marry and have kids someday, but in her 20s, she didn't consider herself to be seriously looking for a spouse. She dated plenty of attractive and successful men, but those relationships didn't last. In retrospect, she says she was prioritizing the wrong things, 
Things like amazing chemistry, sparkling wit, or high status over the kinds of qualities that lead to an enduring partnership. By her 30s, she was trying to be more thoughtful and pragmatic about her choices, but she still insisted on going for her type. She had a great career, but in love, nothing would stick. And if anything, now even fewer of the men available seem to fit her vision of the ideal partner. At 37, she realised her biological clock was ticking. She decided her search for a soulmate could wait. Kid first, love later. She opted to have a child on her own through donor insemination. She has a wonderful son, but looking back, Gottlieb says her belief that she could have a kid and get right back to dating was astoundingly naive. First was the overwhelming fact that she was now a single mum raising a child. When she wasn't child-rearing, she was working to put food on the table. At times, she barely had enough time to sleep, let alone date. But besides that, there were other obstacles, reasons why the deck felt stacked against her. These reasons may not be pretty, but the message is one she says younger women need to hear. A not-so-level playing field. Though it isn't fair, Gottlieb says that, in the world of heterosexual dating at least, things can be harder for older women. Firstly, as we get older, there are fewer natural opportunities to socialise and meet new people. There aren't the same built-in social mechanisms as in college, for example. And when you do meet people, they're increasingly paired off. Secondly, there's the fact that many men preferentially seek female partners who are younger than them, while there seem to be plenty of women willing to date older. Consequently, in each ascending age demographic, there are typically more single women on the dating market for every single man. According to US census figures, in people over the age of 35, there are only 18 million single men compared to 28 million single women. Of those men, many don't look like the typical image of a life partner Gottlieb had always held. In the over 35 range, the men who are serious about commitment and who want a family mostly already have one. Consequently, Many men still on the dating market are divorced with kids. As partners, men with kids from a previous marriage come with certain logistical complications. They also, Gottlieb says, tend to come with a certain amount of emotional baggage from their past relationships. Put all that together and it's just not what she pictured when she was younger. Looking back, Gottlieb remembers many occasions when she rejected or discounted great guys for trivial reasons. There was the guy she wrote off because he had red hair, or the guy who had a couple of irritating verbal mannerisms, like overusing the word awesome. The bottom line was, she thought she could do better. But having refused to compromise then she ended up forced into even bigger compromises later. This is a prime example of the maximizer's curse, and though she's working on it, Gottlieb sees how the problem can compound over time. What happens is that people accrue what economists call sunk costs, meaning, in this case, the time and emotional energy they've already invested in their search. They may then start to think, well, if I've searched this long, I can't compromise. In other words, they search so long, they can't stop searching. Pretty depressing, huh? Well, time to turn things around. Let's look at how you really can find a happy, long-term partnership and what experts say really matters. Spoiler alert. 
It isn't hair colour. Zooming in on the non-negotiables. In researching her book, Gottlieb spoke with many women in successful long-term marriages with all kinds of origin stories. Some couples were wildly in love with each other from the start. Sexual fireworks, butterflies in the stomach, the whole shebang. Others, not at all. They married someone who they felt was a good match for them at the right time in their lives, but without any of that white-hot passion. All those years later, who ended up happier? Surprisingly, Gottlieb reports there was no consistent difference. Initial sparks and passionate chemistry, addictive as they are, don't seem to be all that predictive of long-term relationship satisfaction. So what is? The qualities in a partner that really predict long-term relationship success are things like kindness, good character, shared values and shared goals. Lisa Clampett, a professional matchmaker in New York, shared the criteria she uses to bring matches together. Common relationship goals, shared values, and then a small number, think fewer than five, of key personality traits that her clients define as absolutely paramount for them. For example, intelligence or warmth. As for sparks, Clampett says that if a client has a just okay first date and they feel on the fence about going for a second one, she'll strongly encourage them to. It takes time, she says, for feelings to build and for people's strengths to reveal themselves. Always remember that the qualities that make someone a scintillating date aren't necessarily the same ones that make them a good long-term partner. A lot of the former tend to wash out over time. Love, and even chemistry, can grow over time. Rachel Greenwald, a relationship coach, puts the greatest emphasis on things like sensitivity, emotional maturity, the willingness to commit, and humility. They're far more important, long term, than things like height, charisma, social status, or how much hair he has. After all, he's probably going to lose it anyway. One woman, Elise, recalls how she learned this lesson and how her priorities changed for the better. At 35, her then-partner, a guy who seemed to check all her fantasy boxes, left her and broke her heart. But soon afterwards, she met her now-husband. She didn't feel a huge spark at first, but in a quieter way, he impressed her. He was kind, caring, and showed total integrity of character. She described her approach in choosing him as zooming in on the non-negotiables while being able to forgo the whipped cream. They're now happily married with two children. Instead of worrying about if someone is exactly your type, it's more important to ask, how do you feel around them? Do you feel calm, safe, and content? Don't underestimate the value of someone who you just have a nice time with. Someone who is cold or unkind, who doesn't take responsibility, who is dishonest or disrespectful, those are the real deal breakers. And one more thing matchmakers and researchers alike seem to agree on. Shared values are more important than shared interests. You don't need to share all the same hobbies or personal tastes. Long-term partnership doesn't mean one-stop shopping. You don't need your significant other to fulfil every one of your social needs all by themselves. Your friends can, and should, still play an important role. Just remember. 
Love is something that you build as much as find. It's a choice for you and your partner to enact love for each other. You don't just find a soulmate, you make one. You've just listened to our blink to Marry Him by Laurie Gottlieb. What you've learned is that the key to finding yourself in a happy marriage is focusing on the fundamentals, shared values, shared goals, mutual respect and strength of character. Especially earlier in life, try not to get too hung up on a specific romantic narrative or ideal type. Your priorities will no doubt change as you get older. In love, as well as life, consider whether you're being a maximizer or a satisfizer. The latter strategy can often be wiser and healthier. And whether or not someone seems thrilling right from the start, remember that personal qualities like kindness, honesty, humility and selflessness have benefits that will last a lifetime. Well, before you leave, don't forget to subscribe to Books in Blinks and leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, check out the other titles in our playlist. I'm Pedro from Books in Blinks and I hope to see you here again.